Wonderful. Um, professor Sherrod Semple is a professor in clinical cancer nursing in the Institute of Nursing and Health Research at Ulster University, um, which is a clinical academic appointment uh, with the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust. Sherrod is an experienced clinical academic with over 20 years experience in clinical practice, education and research. Um, I'm speaking with her today is Dr. Jeff Hanna, whose research interests include cancer, end of life and bereavement care. He completed his PhD at Ulster University in 2020, which was an interpretive qualitative study exploring the psychosocial challenges and needs of families when a parent of dependent children is at end of life with cancer and the subsequent immediate bereavement period that follows. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand over to Sherrit and Jeff. Good morning, everyone. And it's a delight to be here today alongside Jeff for this webinar. Um, so the title of our webinar this morning is Supporting Families When an Adult with Significant Caregiving Responsibilities is at End of Life. And I think it's really important that we do know that this um, is part of a programme of work that started off 14 years ago. And we've just got this uh, infographic here that help share our journey, where we can see that our journey started off in 2010. Um, at that point in time, I had just completed my PhD and come back into clinical practice in the area of head and neck cancer as a clinical nurse specialist. And I realized that um, the demographic profile of our patient group um, had changed and was continuing to change with more younger people. Um, at that point in time, um, I realized that myself, alongside other colleagues, were um, finding it more tricky and challenging to support parents newly diagnosed with cancer. And having the inquisitive mind, it got me thinking about um, what does the literature tell us in this space? And myself and another colleague um, were successful in getting some grant money. And we started off looking at um, the support needs of parents um, when they were diagnosed with cancer and had that duality of supporting their young children. We realized at that point that there was a total of 14 studies and most of them were addressing um, mums with breast cancer. And um, this piece of work moved on to our first qualitative study, which delved into the experience of head and neck cancer patients um, whenever they were coping with their diagnosis and parenting. Um, this moved on quite quickly to um, identifying there was that gap in relation to fathers and cancer. And we had a PhD student who explored and unpacked that work in the space by doing a phenomenological study following cancers across uh, 12 months from diagnosis um, and uh, looking at their parenting responsibilities. We are not going to give you the um, key findings from these studies. We will point you at the end as into where the empirical work is held within a hub space within Ulster University. Quite soon after that, my colleague and myself were asked to evaluate the family support service um, uh, run in Northern Ireland by Cancer Focus. So we had looked at the literature, we had explored the experience of head and neck cancer patients, We've done an in-depth and uh, qualitative study looking at fathers. This now gives us the opportunity to spend time with children and understand what their needs were uh, whenever their mom or dad had cancer. Very, very important space for us to be. Um, and we then realized there was needs from both the parents' perspective, but also that the healthcare professionals felt that they lacked the knowledge and the uh, ability to share uh, and support parents newly diagnosed with cancer. And we moved that on to delivering face-to-face -face educational sessions with oncology professionals, moved that on to a sustainable training module um, on an e-learning format. And um, that brings us up to a little bit more in relation to the space and where we are this morning at end of life. Um, there was a sense that 
through some of our work and the growing interest in this space that healthcare professionals were um, supporting parents better at diagnosis. But what was especially challenging was the end of life period. And that's when Dr. Jeff Hanna joined the team. Uh, and as part of his PhD, uh, we started drilling down into that space. Uh, so in relation to the presentation for today, um, the background, and you can see that our first infographic is entitled, Don't Forget the Children. No one knows exactly how many children are bereaved each year. So in the absence of this official data, the Childhood Bereavement Network in 2023 estimated that around 27,000 parents die each year in the UK, leaving dependent children. That equates to one parent every 20 minutes, and that's quite staggering to stop and pause and consider that. When we look at these statistics through the lens of the children, by the age of 16, one in 20 young people will have experienced the death of one or both of their parents. Again, quite astounding. So that's approximately one child in every classroom whenever we consider that. Sadly, many children are not prepared for the death of a parent, even when it's expected, uh, whenever that parent has cancer and is at end of life. And in the absence of being prepared, they are at greater risk of adverse outcomes uh, in that bereavement space, but also in later life. This includes issues in maintaining and sustaining uh, relationships, uh, a decline in the child's education, and a greater involvement for psychiatry, again, in childhood, but also the evidence is very clear in later life as well. So, what are the family challenges and needs? Well, parents want and desire support on how best to manage their children at the end of life period, but they're often unsure of when and how best to tell the children. And often they feel very let down with that lack of directive support from their health and social care professionals. I'm using the term end of life today. Um, and what we mean or how we're defining end of life is in that last 12 months of life. That moves us on to our final infographic on this slide. What is our role as health and social care professionals? Well, we know from some of the work that we've done and also within the literature that professionals often lack the knowledge and confidence in providing this important aspect of family centre cancer care. Furthermore, uh, we just published in 2023 a systematic review and it demonstrated a real dearth of educational interventions to equip professionals. Essentially, in that systematic review, we identified two educational interventions that provided clinicians with the skills and strategies and how best to support parents at end of life with cancer uh, when they had dependent children. So there was a key dearth in this space. So the project that we're presenting today, being one of the projects within our broader program of work, uh, aimed to evaluate the effects of a face-to-face evidence-based and theory-driven educational intervention to equip professionals to deliver family-centered cancer supportive care when a parent with children under 18 is at end of life. We had three specific objectives. That was to improve professionals' knowledge. We want to determine if our intervention did improve um, professionals' knowledge and self-efficacy towards supporting parents at end of life. We also wanted to explore the perceived impact of the intervention on professionals' practice towards supporting parents at end of life with young children. So that's again under 18. So, um, we felt it was important to share a little bit about the face-to-face -face intervention that we were, we had developed and were delivering. So first of all, this intervention was two hours in duration. It was evidence-based. Um, we had the opportunity um, led from Jeff's PhD um, study to have seven empirical um, papers published in peer-reviewed journals. 
that was data that was created from 79 interviews that spanned across four um, study populations. It included uh, parents at end of life. Uh, it included re parents. It included uh, health and social care professionals, both generalists and specialists across um, acute and community settings and also funeral directors. And we've developed this infographic to help share some of the key findings from the study. And um, during the face-to-face -face intervention, we spend considerable time within that two hour period unpacking this infographic, which we can't do today due to the confines of the, the time for the webinar. But really this, in summary, this um, rich data that we obtained from these 79 qualitative interviews enabled us to give a roadmap across the end of life trajectory that last 12 months. Um, and what we could see was there was three key points in time. There was the receiving the poor prognosis and what that meant for the family. Then, as you can see, we've got a purple line uh, with fine arrows in it. This is the um, parent who's got cancer, uh, who's at the end of life having treatments, treatments not working any longer, and their overall physical wellness um, dips along um, and they kind of like um, become a little less unwell, but that becomes a new norm within the family context to a period of time um, which we've described as the second landmark running out of time, the falling off the cliff. We are hearing this very frequently from uh, the bereaved parents that there was a point in time where things accelerated, that ill parent became um, much more acutely unwell. And this was in around the last um, short weeks, um, month or so of life. And things were catching up um, much sooner than the family had anticipated and the sense of falling off the cliff edge at that stage. And the third key landmark was that um, actual death and what was happening within the family in those short days um, in advance of the actual death. We have marked on this infographic key points in time where health and social care professionals have key roles where they can support families and particularly parents in that providing the honest information about the prognosis, the uh, advice on how best to prepare for the future as we can see here and then guidance on how best to tell the children. So we unpack this uh, much more in the face-to-face -face training, but this gives you some high level overview and a reference to where you can find more information about that. Again, within the intervention, the face-to-face -face intervention, we share our talking, telling and sharing framework uh, at end of life. So this is a step-by-step -step framework designed to help professionals and power parents on when and how to communicate their poor prognosis with their children. It spans two steps. The first step is helping the professional to open up the conversation with parents assessing at the same time their attitudes, beliefs, and readiness about sharing their poor prognosis with their children. And then the step two um, helps uh, the professional with that guidance on how and when to uh, help support sharing the poor prognosis with their children. Step one has a number of very straightforward uh, questions that can start with that assessment and also looking at the parents' readiness about sharing the poor prognosis. Again, um, we unpack this in much more detail in our face-to-face -face training, but I think one of the key questions is, do you have any children? A very simple question that any of us can embed into our practice, but it starts uh, garnering that conversation. It starts um, opening up that conversation. Again, another straightforward question is, how many children do you have and assessing their age? Because we know that um, the information needs plus the reactions of children are very much determined by their developmental stage. Again, just moving the conversation forward, you can ask, what do the children know? So establishing the B 
baseline of where that family's at. Have they had any previous conversations about their cancer diagnosis? Um, or is this a point in time whenever the parent has received the poor prognosis to start and build on the conversations? And then assessing the readiness through what are your thoughts about telling? We are very cognizant that uh, not every parent will be ready to tell their children. And it's not uncommon in some clinical situations to um, have parental resistance. Um, being aware of that, um, we have embedded three questions that can really help or uh, can be seen as statements uh, as well, how to nudge these conversations forward. I think it's really important that we acknowledge that these conversations are really difficult. Um, and then also from our understanding that children do pick up that things are wrong. Um, they have seen the, as we can see from the child's drawing on this screen here, they have listened to the whispered conversations. They're trying to understand um, what's happening because they're seeing changes within the home. Granny's potentially visiting a little bit more and more flowers are coming. Um, there's um, more conversations are taking place on the phone. So um, they're trying to figure out what's going on and the absence of being involved and make up their own narrative, which sometimes can be an increasingly more scary space for the children by not knowing the truth. And again, um, that conversation that can help nudge um, the parent into a state of readiness to share is explain the children want uh, to be involved and informed and this is based on evidence. The second step in our communication framework is the 6W grid. Um, again, um, we'll not take you through all of this today, but we'll pick up in a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> we look at why it's important for the children to be informed. We've covered some of that uh, already today. Who is the best person to share the diagnosis with the children? In reality, it's a trusted adult, and uh, more often than not, that is the parent. If it's a two-parent family, we would encourage um, both parents to be involved in sharing the poor prognosis. And what we clearly know from our research is that the well parent wants to be involved in these conversations, assessing the reactions of the children, knowing that they're the one who's going to be involved in that sole parenting role whenever the ill parent dies. So that's a key point to be mindful of. The when, um, there's no, um, you know, right time is finding the best time um, to have that conversation. And um, when we think about the what, what are the things that it's important for parents to be doing to prepare for that parental death? Again, I think this is all within the caveat of providing clear and honest information to the children. Encouraging them to capture life as it happens doesn't need to be big things, but things such as uh, taking uh, photographs, little videos, um, and just capturing those uh, days um, as they're maybe out having a walk in the park. They don't need to be big things. They're not the needing to be going to Disneyland, but just the um, out in the park, going for an ice cream, catching, capturing life that happens is really important. There is a point in time where it's really important um, for parents to draw on their support networks, and we do encourage that. And also we spend some time in the face-to-face uh, -face training of why, what plans is it important for families to be making in preparing for the future. Some key things in relation to words, um, key principles, uh, important to use the word cancer, important to use the word death and dying. Uh, these are concrete things that children can understand and it's important that we um, encourage the use of them within our conversations whenever we're preparing children for parental death. Not giving false hope and um, uh, avoiding euphemisms such as lost and passed away. Um, to help um, frame good practice um, and also 
uh, we have embedded within the face-to-face -face training is seven short educational videos. These were co-produced um, with um, professional actors uh, from the Lyric Theatre, a bereaved mum and a creative learning educationalist and two clinical academics, Jeff and myself. Um, and this again maps key conversations over the end of life period that uh, is important for healthcare professionals to have with parents. Um, we're not going to go through all of them today, but just to give you a snapshot of them, the next couple of slides will take us through the first two videos. And they're pretty short, between one and three minutes. Again, we acknowledge that these are seen within larger conversations within the clinical context, um, but um, what they do is um, give some sense of guidelines and good principles. Hi, David, Janet. Thanks for coming in today. How are you? Hi, feeling good. Dr. Mullen, thanks. Um, You're doing really well. Hi. Yeah. Back to normality, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, as you know, David, we did some tests recently. Uh, we took your bloods and we did a, a CT scan. Um, we've had an opportunity to look at those results. And unfortunately, uh, we can see that the cancer has spread um, from the CT scan. We can see that it has spread to your liver and your lungs. Um, I'm really sorry, David. I know this is not the, the news you're expecting to hear today. No, not, not at all. I mean, I don't really understand how that could happen after, you know, eight weeks ago we were here and everything was very good, yeah. all clear. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm back running again. I'm playing with the boys. I'm feeling good. I don't really understand how that could happen. With the nature of cancer, there's there's always a risk that it can come back, even with good treatment. So, um, what treatment are we looking at? Like, is surgery an option at yeah. this stage? Or? Um, once the cancer has spread to multiple parts of the body, uh, surgery is no longer an option. Um, we're not looking at curing the cancer. We are going to try and manage the symptoms uh, through treatment like chemotherapy. We want to try and keep the cancer at bay. We want to try and slow it down and give you as long as possible, David. How long are we talking here, Doctor? In our experience, in all honesty, David, we're looking at around 12 months. Um, so, so what are we doing next? I mean, um, We've got a we've got a holiday booked for next week. Do we do we go on that or? Yeah, I would I would recommend that you do anything you want to do sooner rather than later. Um, it's really important that you spend time together as a family. Okay. Right. So, what what do we do next? I want just to take time to to process what I've told you today. I know it's really difficult news. Uh, you'll come back to see me in a couple of weeks and we'll we'll talk about how your treatment's going to progress. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we can see in this short video that maps across our infographic of sharing the poor prognosis and how we as healthcare professionals have that um, key role in ensuring the patient um, has a clear understanding of their oral prognosis. We're moving us along to our second video. And at that, um, what we'll see from our second video is something that as healthcare professionals, we have limited insight into as of what it's like for that individual and their core other person with them um, after they leave the consultation room.
I wasn't expecting that. God. We're gonna tell the kids. Don't do that to them. No, but we have to. We have to tell them something. You know, they're gonna. They they're thought, gonna. They thought I was getting better. They thought I was better. I know. I know. So did I. So did we all. But they're gonna know something's up. We have to. We have to tell them something. And we've always told them every step of the way the truth. You know. So. This is different. This is gonna destroy them. I know. I. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what I would even say. I'm trying to process this still myself. Maybe if like, we're back in there with the doctor in two weeks' time. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk to him, try and get a bit more information. Okay. And then think about telling the boys, because I just can't right now. I know. I, know. I, I just, I wouldn't even know what to say. Um, okay, so... We'll just we'll can talk you, to can you wait for that? Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk we'll talk to the doctor and get yeah. get some more information. Okay. So that's a snapshot of two of the videos. Um the other videos is returning to um see Dr. Mullen where they get more information on how to share. Uh, their diagnosis with their children and actually gives the words and the language to equip the parents to have these difficult conversations. Um, there's other videos then that take us through the um, that timeline that we've showed in the infographic right through to video seven, which is helping the um, well parent to share the um, information that that the dad is dying, that David is dying, and some sense of the physiological um, aspects of death, which quite often parents have no understanding or insight to because they haven't experienced death themselves to date. Um, within the educational intervention, the face-to-face -face two hour session, we have a bereaved mum who comes and shares her lived experience and the um, the intervention is facilitated by both Jeff and myself as clinical academics um, with our interest in this area. So to date, um, as part of this study, uh, we delivered 14 sessions from September 21 to September 23 with 347 professionals trained. And at this juncture, I'm going to hand over to Jeff to take you through the research design and findings and a little bit more of where we're at and progressing this work. So thank you for your time this morning and I'm handing over to Jeff. So as Charity said, I'm going to share a little bit more about how we have evaluated the face-to-face -face educational interventions that we've been delivering from September 21 to September 23. We've worked within the Kirkpatrick's model of evaluation, which looks across four different levels of evaluation. Level one, looking into individuals' reactions to the training, level two their learning level three their behavior which is looking very much into how professionals have implemented um, the training and how that's impacted onto their practice level four is not something we've been able to complete as part of this um training to date but it's something that we're currently working on in one of our current programs and i can share a little bit with that um, as we come towards the end of the session so as part of evaluating the resource, or sorry, as part of evaluating the training, we've done pre and post test surveys and um, before and after the educational intervention using a validated self-efficacy scale and single item questions regarding the um, course usefulness and relevance um, to their own clinical practice. And that's very much looking into levels one and two of Kirkpatrick's model of evaluation. Then, at least three months after the educational intervention, we've conducted qualitative interviews with some health and social care professionals to explore a little bit more about how they have implemented um, some of the um, training into their practice. And that's looking across um, the third level of which is behaviour. So overall, we had 274 participants who had completed the pre-survey with 239 who had did the post-survey. 
And within that, 216 had did both the pre and post um, survey. The qualitative interviews, there was a total of 14 of those which were conducted between three and 19 months after they'd taken part in one of the sessions with an overall mean average of around nine months after the educational intervention. The quantitative data had been analysed using descriptive and inferential statistics and we used Brown and Clark's reflexive thematic analysis um, to a uh, framework to um, analyse the qualitative interviews. So looking all first of all um, into the quantitative findings and I want to break these down into Kirkpatrick's different levels. So first of all looking into level one which is the reactions um, scored out of a maximum score of five of which um, represented strongly agree most of the professionals then um, were strongly agreeing or agreeing that the workshop objectives were clear, it was delivered at a suitable place, the content was relevant to their practice, and that they would recommend the training to um, a, another colleague who was working within cancer care. And you can see that being depicted by the mean scores there, um, averaging between 4.58 up until about 4.8, and that would have been of a maximum score of 5. Then looking into the learning, and this was using um, AXPO's um, validated measure of self-efficacy. In terms of some of our single item questions here, um, professionals did believe that the um, in educational intervention actually increased their knowledge and was detailed enough to meet their training needs. Of the self-efficacy scale, of which is 12 items looking across um, their confidence and competence, um, which is defined as their self-efficacy to have conversations in routine practice with parents regarding their children. We find a statistically significant um, a difference in scores between pre and post intervention. And when we look at the mean scores on average, the mean score at a pre intervention was around 45 and that had significantly increased to 98 um, after um, completing the educational intervention. But we wanted to, and as you can see, um, the uh, line graph then sort of showing on the screen is showing those two differences um, between the two groups. But interestingly, what we had also found was that there was 39 professionals who had also reported having previous training into this area. And what we found was that there was a statistically significant um, difference on the test between subjects effects on the pre and post intervention with those who had previous learning. And to break it down, um, simply what we had found was there was a, a huge larger gap, which can be um, represented here between those who had previous training and those who did not have previous training. But that gap then actually became reduced um, after the intervention where the two groups then um, were reporting similar scores. And it wasn't really until we had got to the qualitative interviews where we were able to explore that a little bit further. So thinking about the qualitative interviews and the analysis of those, um, and again, this is looking into Kirkpatrick's um, level three, which is behaviour. I want to share some of the um, sort of um, broad highlights of key findings we find within those interviews. So overall, um, professionals did believe that they had um, gained new um, tools and studies on how to progress these family-centred cancer care conversations in routine practice particularly um, with a number of those parents who um, professionals believed were emotionally not ready to tell their children, they felt that they had gained this confidence and knowledge on how to nudge parents forward and recognising the benefits and importance of telling the children the reality of the poor prognosis. A lot of professionals did actually reflect back onto um, some of their clinical situations prior to taking part in the training situation and it reflected if only I had have, um, nudged and sort of pushed those conversations forward at that point in time but had reflected that they didn't have the training and the skill to enable them to do that at that point in time. We also had found um, within um, this um, uh, qualitative interviews that professionals then find themselves actually actively steering some other professionals into the importance of having these family-centered conversations and particularly where there was contexts, where there was some clinical nurse specialists and other um, nurse related um, disciplines who had felt I'm very happy to have those conversations um, with the parent about how to support their children, but that needs to start with you sharing the honest information regarding the poor prognosis. And again, some professionals felt that they didn't have the confidence then to be able to do this prior to taking part within the intervention. 
Now, the aspects of the intervention that many professionals felt had impacted their practice was actually having a communication framework, um, which Cherith has um, shared a little bit about this morning, where they felt they actually had um, the language and what it is that they're supposed to use to share in their practice as parents um, prepare to tell their children the reality of the poor prognosis and supporting them throughout that end of life experience. The educational video resources were also deemed as supportive um, for professionals as it gave them a little um, indication as to, well, how can I um, role play this um, within uh, my own clinical role? And some professionals had reported going back into those videos, which are available online, um, to watch and sort of refresh their memory um, of what it is they needed to do whenever they were actually faced with those clinical situation encounters of that parent who had a poor cancer prognosis. And finally as well, listening to um, Lisa's um, story as a bereaved parent was helpful for um, professionals in shaping into the context, the reality of, I really want to do better in my clinical role and I want this experience to be better for families. And very much what it was helpful for many of the professionals involved um, in the sessions and who reported back on the qualitative interviews it very much put the research findings into context where they could see how um, what was shared um, between the research findings, the communication framework and the educational videos mapped and mirrored very much Lisa's story. Now, there was um, a number of elements that were discussed within the qualitative interviews of how professionals felt um, they needed a little bit more than and to be able to progress these family-centered conversations in practice. One of those was advanced communication skills training, where there was a number of professionals who felt they still needed opportunities to rehearse and to practice these conversations in supportive environments, perhaps with colleagues and peers, before having them in, in reality with a number of um, parents who would be at end of life. And advanced communication skills training programs was identified as an appropriate place to where this could be embedded as part of that training. There were also some professionals who felt that they would require a booster session or sort of ongoing um, training in this area of family centered cancer care, especially if they found themselves not having these conversations on a routine basis or if they worked within uh, perhaps a tumour group then that's maybe less representative um, of younger um, parents and adults. And of course, then a number of professionals then also highlighted the importance of having an aligned practice. And what that meant was they very much felt, you know, I can't be out here leading um, this way on my own. It's important for other professionals then to be trained in this aspect of family centered cancer care so that we're all working off the same sphere um, and we all have that insight and understanding of the importance of having family centered conversations and that it doesn't um, fall back to that one professional um, within practice. So to promote the sustainability um, in this training, much like um, the work that has been done at Diagnosis, which Cherith had shared earlier into this uh, session this morning, we have translated um, this face-to-face um, -face to our educational intervention into a 40-minute e-learning resource. We've um, developed and uh, adapted the e-learning resource using the person-based approach with end users, a number of PPI individuals and our expert steering group alongside um, our own academic research team um, to develop the e-learning resource. The resource is currently sitting on the Palliative Hub. Um, it's free to access. Um, it can be accessed using the short URL of fccceoled.com, where, where you'd have to register an account then to be able to access the resource. Of course, evaluation is very important to us um, as we progress this um, body of work and identify what else is um, required um, still within this area of family-centered cancer care. Um, so we are very much promoting the evaluation of um, the resource with the pre and post um, surveys um, over the next um, coming weeks um, as we bring this project towards its current close. So I just like um, to take the opportunity to thank um, all of the health and social care trusts within um, the north of Ireland who have been supportive, not only um, in a financial role in some aspects, but also in facilitating um, the educational um, intervention sessions to take place over the two year period and Cancer Fund for Children who had also um, hosted one of those sessions back in 2021. So that brings us towards the end of um, our sort of webinar today, but um, we would like to invite the opportunity now for any questions 
um, that you may have in relation to this um, body of work um, or even more specifically towards where we're currently working on. Super. Thank you, Jeff. And also thank you to Sherith. That was quite a remarkable run through of your research there. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you also so much for for leaving questions for us, uh, time for us for questions. Um, so, I, you know, if anyone has any questions, um, please post them into the chat box. Um, I have I have a few questions, but, you know, I'd really like to hear from the audience on this. So I'd encourage people not to be shy. Um, can I, um, may I pose a question? Of course, I'll take Emer and then Christine Irvine has her hand up. Uh, so I'll take you first, Emer. Just to say, um, you know, Sherith, I've been aware of your work for a while, but this is the first time I've seen it set out in detail and I'm just totally blown away. I just think this is research at its absolute best. It's just so impactful. Um, and I really liked how, you know, your evidence and grounded in the evidence and then and in experience. Um, and I was my question was about um those those qualitative interviews you you had. How much of that how much of it did you feel like you knew in advance and reinforced what you'd found in the previous evidence? And how much did you feel you learned more and felt that there were different people you needed to talk to? I would just be really interested in, in what changed as a result of that phase. Um, just to share the context, um, this the 79 interviews were part of Jeff's PhD. So Jeff and I done the um, bereaved parents and end of life um, parent interviews collectively together um, with myself leading Jeff taking the rich field notes and then we sat after each of them quite often in a coffee shop uh, debriefing and also starting with that data analysis process. Um, I have conducted numerous qualitative interviews over my career um, but I have to say, these interviews with the bereaved parents and those at end of life were the ones that have shaped my career and my thinking most. It was an absolute privilege to have that opportunity to spend more often an hour and a half and sometimes up to two hours in that space with that bereaved parent where they were incredibly honest um, and uh, we we garnered a lot of really um rich data. One of the things that I'm going to like hand over to Jeff that we did realize because uh, parents and their close family members were not getting always the support that they needed or required from healthcare professionals, particularly um, at that um, actual death period, those um, days coming up to the actual death, um, more often or not. And where they did reflect were and um, key support mechanism that they drew upon was funeral directors. So it wasn't planned as part of Jeff's PhD study to interview funeral directors, but taking this as a very um, clear lead from our data, then uh, we did spend time interviewing funeral directors, both in the rural and urban context. Um, and again, we had, um, quite a, an interesting time in conducting interviews with the funeral directors and I'll maybe let Jeff highlight some of the key findings that influence um, our work uh, th in that area. Yeah, certainly going back to around 2017, 2018, um, whenever the interviews were being conducted with health and social care professionals, a lot of our um, consistent themes um, were being identified within those and that, you know, it was the challenging aspect of care, difficulties and how do you open up those conversations, what was the words, what was the language, um, but it was going out then and through interviewing then the parents alongside those interviews where what we were establishing was a lot of parents found that there was a lack of that instructive support, advice and guidance given from healthcare professionals throughout that sort of last 12, 18 month um, window, whatever that looked like for each family, in that um, by the time then death became more imminent in those final weeks and days of life, a lot of bereaved parents had said they didn't have that time to make enough of those preparations for that end of life experience, but very much did reflect, you know, wish we had have done so earlier, wish we had have been steered a bit more in that journey. But very much then as death became more imminent, healthcare teams had sort of moved along. The next 
professional, as I use um, the word um, loosely due to being an unregulated profession, was the funeral director coming into the home. And it was very much the bereaved parents who were looking to the funeral directors and being like, what is it we're supposed to do now? We've avoided perhaps this situation for so long. We can't do so anymore. How do I, you know, explain to my child that mum or dad has died here? And there was varying degrees of funeral director support coming in there. There was some who were very much actively steering parents through that approach of how to tell the children mum or dad has died and very much, you know, involving them in that immediate bereavement period and the children being part of the planning of the funeral, what, you know, the period of perhaps the wake would look like very much within our own Irish context and over that two, three day window um, to even being involved um, during the rituals within the funeral service. And again, the flip side of that was also found where there was some funeral directors coming in, very task focused, getting the funeral planned, um, see in two, three days for the funeral. So there was varying degrees of support within there. The interesting, um, and, and probably, you know, it's very much the journey that, you know, Cherith and I are both on and part of this work. Um, during the um, roadshow um, sessions, as they were, as we've called them over the last two years, and doing those 14 qualitative interviews with the healthcare professionals, I have the person say were um, very remarkable and significant to the healthcare professional interviews that were done four years earlier. And um, that result of having, you know, training, getting the advice and guidance on where those key conversations should be, what is the words, the language to use, what is it professionals should do. There was just a real sense of professionals feeling, I feel a lot more equipped in my job role now and taking that active approach. And, you know, personally, I'd say, you know, doing interviews four or five years previous, that that was very much not the response we were getting. And it very much harnessed what we know within this work in that, you know, the power of education and training and communication skills um, very much then did enhance professionals' um, skill um, to have these important um, family-centric conversations at end of life. Thanks, guys. Um, I'll go to Christine. And if you can, please uh, turn on your camera. Um, Christine Irvine. Okay, so my name is Christine Irvine and um, I work in the policy team at, at Marie Curie and um, I've actually been aware of your, your programme but it was really nice to get a, a refresher this morning um, and I've watched all four of the educational videos and I have to say they were incredibly powerful to watch. Um, so um, it's been really interesting to see how you're approaching the evaluation of your, your training as well because um, as you may know, Marie Curie is taking the lead on a school's bereavement program, um, and that's really trying to fill fill a gap um, in terms of teachers' skills and strategies and, and supporting children who um, have been bereaved or her have, or, and also in terms of grief education more generally to that preventative um, approach to supporting children to understand the the language, the words, the, the feelings and emotions attached to um, the death of someone, a significant other. Um, so let me turn it on now, thank you. Um, so I've just a few questions in terms of your, your programme. Um, so you talked about um, advice and preparing for the future um, as one of the key, key things that it's important to engage uh, parents on who have been given a terminal diagnosis. So. Does that mean um, that the program is linking in with that advice care planning policy now that is very much up there in terms of what um, HSC is being um, staff are being asked to um, implement in terms of their their practice? The the other thing, um, sorry, I'll give you them all, and then it'd be great if you could even just um, touch on everything I'm saying. And um, the other thing is around whether this training can be applied to other types of terminal conditions. So I know the focus is around um, cancer, but I'm wondering, uh, do you feel it's applicable to other types of um, conditions that are, are terminal? Um, and lastly, um, I, I really picked up on your um, the good practice around aligning practice and so that the, the training is, you know, spread out. To, to as wide a range of healthcare professions as possible that are linking in and as part of the, the care of the, these pe people who are terminal and at end of life. And if you could touch a wee bit on, on that link with more formal counselling and, and whether that's something that that um, staff are, are required to do or in, the, in this context and how easy or difficult that is. 
Okay, Christine, thank you for those questions. And there's quite a lot there. So absolutely, uh, we see the importance of um, embedding the work within the uh, previous work and the ongoing work that's around either advanced care planning or future care planning. I know that terminology is changing today and uh, it's absolutely integral because we did find from the qualitative interviews that um, the bereaved parent wished there was more had been done um, across different facets, whether that was from a financial point of view, whether it was like just knowing the passwords, knowing um, the, um, the parent who died, their wishes in around the funeral period of time, um, so there was like quite a lot of key things that um, was identified from those interviews. So absolutely needs to be harnessed and is harnessed within that uh, framework. Um, terminal cancer um, and other conditions. Um, we have challenged ourselves in that space. We to date have stayed within the um, disease entity that our clinical practice is embedded on within cancer care. However, we do see that there is applicability and principles that can be mapped across. One of the things that Jeff did find from the qualitative interviews with the professionals was they were looking for the words, they were looking for the language, and we felt that we were going to stay within that definition of end of life within the cancer context of 12 months because it enabled us then to harness um, you know, the language and give like clear statements and clear ideas of how those conversations could be progressed. Because what would be required for other life limiting conditions that span a number of years, that communication would look very different. And then um, Jeff was reporting on the alignment of practice. So I'll hand over to Jeff to respond to that part of your question. Yeah, just sorry, I want to go back just a wee bit to the, the earlier questions. Just then, um, what we did find in the qualitative interviews and in where we've used our language and um, preparing for the future or um, planning for the future, professionals find it was a more softer, open way, engaging these conversations with parents of being like, well, what do you mean planning for the future? What does that look like? And that's then where it was often suggestions, you know, making wills, you're sorting out the mortgages, the passwords on the accounts, any guardianship for the children. When terminology, you know, advanced care planning was used, it was very much, oh, but that's not me, I'm not there. So it was about using language that was more friendlier in those situations, um, but was um, enabling the conversation for parents to come back. What do you mean by that? Certainly with the, um, you know, expanding onto life limiting other conditions, um, one of our resources, which we did alongside King's College London, was looking into 10 top tips on how to have um, conversations with that important significant adult who has a life limiting condition and very much as Charith has said you know we didn't go specifically into the cancer entity there but what we feel is a, um, slightly missing there is is that um, importance of using the language and that's very much what professionals are looking for but certainly the principles um, from within a cancer context um, does expand across into other conditions but it's about um, giving the professionals the specifics in relation to language um, the question then on to aligned practice, could you just refresh me, sorry, what the yeah, question I, was? I'm happy enough to pick up on yeah. that one. What we have in our e-learning resource and also in our face-to-face -face educational intervention is um, a training um, format that's applicable for a range of health and social care professionals because we feel that it's important for a community of practice to start to have these conversations because we often know that it's at night potentially um, whenever a staff nurse is in night duty or a healthcare assistant that these conversations can uh, take place. So we, we wanted to make our training accessible for a range of health and care, uh, health and social care professions. So it would be aligned to practice in that format. Super, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Christine, for your for your question. Um, just very quickly, we have one or two minutes if anyone has a, a very quick question before we go. Um, 
I don't see a hand up or anything in the chat for a question. So I have one very quick question myself, uh, Sherrits and Jeff. You mentioned your qualitative interviews. So I'm just wondering, how did you manage the analysis of that? Because I mean, I mean 79 qualitative interviews, that's, you know, where 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 did you start essentially? And, and very quickly, if you could run us through even, how did you manage that? Um, yeah, so the, the interview sample groups um, were individually cut um, analyzed um, according to the group. So there was um, 32 health and social care professionals across acute and community settings. And very much um, that piece of work was looking into what are professionals very much doing within their practice? What does their experience look like? And what was their challenges and key needs um, that, that was uh, arising out of that? The work then um, with funeral directors then, um, sorry, just the, the study with um, health and social care professionals then had been published in Psycho-Oncology. Then the work then with uh, funeral directors was looking into funeral directors' experiences of that immediate bereavement period and um, how they were supporting the family in around that time, but also key reflections looking back into what could have been um, better done for those families in the end of life space to facilitate that um, immediate bereavement period. And that very much um, provided a lot of our evidence and support in the planning for the future space and what did that um, very much look like. Then the 21 interviews which had been done with the bereaved parents then was very much looking across the end of life trajectory and the, the infographic sort of roadmap that Charith had showed where it sort of showed that illness trajectory um, was um, um, born out of essentially that data then and um, generating what our theory looked like um, and representing those last 12 months of life for families. We then had then lifted all of those bodies of work and then had done a triangulation of our studies and brought together highlighting then the key similarities and differences between um, the sample groups of which then we had also brought in the three interviews that had been done with the parents who were at end of life. And just due to significant challenges of recruiting the parents at end of life, that's why we had moved our study into looking into interviews with bereaved parents. But what we found was um, the three interviews with the um, parents at end of life had mapped and mirrored those with the bereaved parent, um, but of course only up to a certain point in that trajectory. And even just um, as an example of that, due to the lack of those um, sort of preparations and support made at end of life, which bereaved parents had reflected to us, they were very much reflective of where some of the parents who were at end of life um, were in their own experience at that point in time. The triangulation was a really interesting piece because then we mm. were able to have three broad themes that looked at um, sharing the poor prognosis, the role of hope, and seeing how that interplayed across the different um, sample populations uh, where there were similarities and some differences. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Absolutely fascinating. Um, so we're we're on the dot of twelve o'clock here. So I'm going to to bring the webinar to a close. I'd like to thank firstly, uh, Sherrod and Jeff, for your time. That was absolutely fascinating. It was a wonderful piece of research, and to see it grow from research into impact, into into resources, and and making change is is absolutely wonderful. So thank you both so much for your time. Thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, we really appreciate your time also.